Thank you all for coming out to this workshop. Um, I'm really glad that so many who are interested, um, I guess you have to be, you're graduating from this list program, but it's, it's good to see this, and thank you to everyone who's participating online as well. We'll be monitoring for uh, questions and answers throughout the evening. Um, it shouldn't uh, take too long. Since um, myself and the other members of ALA who have tried to uh, help organize this have not graduated yet, um, we're going to be turning it over to three different speakers. Uh, earlier in the process rather than later. 
it really shouldn't be a huge ordeal to collect the items in the portfolio guidelines. There are suggested artifacts from the required courses. Uh, and then you can include additional artifacts from your electives as well. Keep in mind that these are suggested artifacts. And we know that as time goes on, assignments in different core classes change. So you may find that you need to uh, substitute one assignment for another because when you took 600, you had three essay papers to do and not quizzes or whatever. Uh, that is a conversation that you can have with your advisor. You can also have that conversation with the instructor of the course that you took that there may be a question about uh, what artifacts to include. Uh, do focus on quality and not necessarily quantity. Uh, you want to look at the core competencies that are listed in the uh, guidelines and be sure that you're addressing those and not just adding additional items to make your portfolio thicker. So once you've addressed uh, one particular item thoroughly, uh, you do not need to then add a third and a fourth and a fifth artifact specifically for that uh, competency. Um, when you begin your final semester to make contact with your advisor early in the semester, uh, you do have the option of having a draft looked at by your advisor uh, at least two weeks prior to the time that your uh, portfolio is due. And so take advantage of that because you will get feedback from your advisor uh, that potentially could ins help ensure that you are passing successfully. So I encourage you to do that. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, you know, our faculty are really good about talking with students. So anytime that you want to talk with your advisor, anytime that you want to talk with another faculty member to get another perspective or feedback about a substitution of, of an artifact item, take advantage of that. You can come to campus, you can call on phone, you can email, uh, they can be reached a variety of ways. Smoke signal does not, has not been as reliable lately. Uh, we're looking into that, but I would not suggest it. So carrier pigeon. Carrier pigeon <laughs> has worked well. Um, so lots of ways to get in touch with the faculty. Please do get in touch with them. They're here to, to help you all. Um, and any advice that I can give, I'm more than happy to give as well. So. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to these two. And I'm going to still be here for questions, but I want to help uh, main computers. I can go next. Go. <laughs> Doesn't yeah. matter to me. Um, I'll go ahead and talk a little bit since it'll be an easy transition, I guess. Um, I was just going to talk a little bit about um, how I put together my portfolio, the things that I included, and some kind of uh, interesting things I discovered along the way. Um, I guess um, it, it's been over and it's in your packet, what all is required of your portfolio. Um, I guess I will talk a little bit about what I ended up selecting for mine. Um, for 600, I did include my paper and my final exam for that course. Um, for 601, my Pathfinder and the essay that went along with that Pathfinder, um, which is one of the substitutions that Will talked about. Um, I don't believe that it says Pathfinder in the selected artifacts, um, so, but I chose to use that one instead. Um, for 602, I chose my metadata assignment and my thesaurus. Um, 603, my strategic plan, which I was very proud of. I worked on it with some of the lovely ALA people. Um, for 636, I submitted my database and my web page project, both of those for that class. Um, and then I chose not to include extra technical um, course electives because my focus throughout um, grad school was in children's and teen lit. Um, and I took a lot of electives in those areas. So um, my three extra assignments that I submitted were um, a story time assignment that I did for 610 um, and an annotated bibliography for teens and a book talk that I did for middle school age kids for 614. Um, and then along with those assignments, I did include the handouts and like the bibliographies and the little brochures and things that I made for them. So any kind of thing that you submit with your portfolio, I would recommend submitting um, any like relevant information, any handouts, things like that, that you had made up. And um, I did also submit the essays that went along with those. Um, generally with items like that, it's best to include everything that kind of like gets across because I mean, obviously the teacher didn't see me do the story time. So anything that can help get across what you got out of it, what it was like, um, how you enjoyed it, things like that, that really kind of make it a more well-rounded portfolio. Um, I didn't really include any extra artifacts aside from, like I said, the extra stuff that went along with my um, three elective <coughs> um, artifacts that I submitted with it. Um, as far as the essays go, um, 
uh, whenever I submitted my rationales for my various artifacts, I structured that as one single document and then went through and separated each rationale for each artifact by paragraphs. Um, it just kind of helped me kind of figure out where everything was going, make sure I had it all in one place. Um, I found that to be really helpful. Um, I had everything all stacked together in a folder on my documents and I kind of was moving things in and out. And I would highly recommend that you get everything formatted the way you want it. You should name it. Um, you should name the file something that makes sense <laughs> um, because you cannot change the file name and you can see the file name once you upload it to Blackboard. So name it something you're going to be happy with. Um, and make sure you're ready to upload before you do because you cannot edit the items once you upload them to Blackboard. So if you want to upload it in chronological order by class, then you need to do that because there's no moving it around once you get it in there. Um, so yeah, uh, I figure I'm mostly here for a question capacity. So when we get to the q and I'd be happy to let you guys know anything else that you're wondering about. Okay, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Professor Joe Miller. And is, is it easier if I stand or sit or does it matter? Stay, stay seated. <laughs> All right. I'll stay kind of. Uh, I just have a couple of comments to add to the discussion and, and uh, we'll also be available for questions as they come up. Um, when John mentioned, you know, having your portfolio to your advisor like two months before the semester starts that you're going to graduate or some, that's a little overly optimistic, I think. I mean, but you know, I, I think really the, the hope is, is that you're working on or thinking about your portfolio throughout your program. I mean, as you take courses, while it's still fresh in your mind, you know, that's a good time to sort of, you know, reflect a little bit about what that course has done to advance your knowledge and to give you a deeper understanding of uh, what the program's trying to achieve. Um, just so I know, I mean, <clears throat> how many of you are graduating this semester? I mean, that's generally what, you know, motivates people to get very interested in talking about. Is anybody here uh, who's not going to be graduating this semester but just wants information about it? So, <laughs> so, I mean, again, for a few of you who have a little more time, I mean, you know, you can certainly kind of factor that in as, you know, you think about this process that you'll be engaging in your last semester. Uh, for those of you who are graduating this semester, you know, uh, I do have some specific kinds of tips or advice I would give uh, about, you know, how you approach some of the writing. Uh, so I'll take a couple of minutes and just talk about some of that. Um, the other thing I would mention is that, I mean, I have been on the, the committee that's been writing portfolio guidelines, and the process of developing guidelines is an ongoing one. Uh, you know, for instance, the guidelines you uh, worked under are probably slightly different than the guidelines that we have now. Uh, so it's real important to make sure that you have the most current, up-to-date version of the portfolio guidelines because we discovered not too long ago that even though we weren't actively linking to some of these older versions, they might still exist out there on that internet thing, you know, and so uh, they just don't go away always. So, I mean, again, uh, you know, the ones that we're working on now should be dated, I think they're the March 2012 yes. version, and you should see a date that, you know, will help tip you off that you're looking at the most recent uh, iteration uh, of the guidelines. Um, you know, a couple of things that uh, have already been touched on that I'll sort of emphasize, I mean, your advisor is your friend. Now, I mean, not literally, maybe, but I mean, but they're there to help. And, you know, take advantage of the support and advice that you can get from your advisor and also from other individual faculty. Um, you know, if you have a question about, you know, you took a core course sometime in the distant past and you're not sure if the artifacts that you have still aligned with what's expected for that uh, current version of the guidelines, Talk to the person that taught that course if they're not here anymore. Talk to whoever's teaching it now, as well as your advisor, and they can offer some help and suggestions about whether you have the appropriate mix of, of, of artifacts to submit with your portfolio. Um, when they talked about doing it two weeks before it's due to your advisor, the idea here really, the language is, is that it can't be any later 
than two weeks before the due date and still have the expectation that you're going to get very much feedback from your advisor. Uh, and obviously that's to sort of protect us a little bit from getting 20 portfolios the day before they're due with people saying, we want your input, help me. And you kind of say, well, it's really kind of too late for me to really uh, give you meaningful input and time for you to revise. Um, when Will mentioned that we don't give a lot of uh, feedback at the end of the process other than sort of the pass-fail, uh, that's true, but I think if you're looking for more uh, specific kinds of feedback, your advisor is the person who can give that to you in that initial review of the portfolio that will happen uh, no later than two weeks before the due date. Uh, because it's my job, I, I, really, I view it as my job, to not only give advice about how it could be changed, but also to complement or highlight things that I think have been done really well. So <clears throat> if you're looking for some of that kind of positive feedback, you know, you'll probably get it just when you have uh, your advisor review the portfolio. Uh, once we actually get you know, 50 portfolios, I mean, our job is to really just kind of say yes or no. You know, this is, you know, meeting our criteria or it's not. Uh, as it was mentioned, there are two reviews done. Uh, your advisor is the first reader, and then there's a second reader assigned for each portfolio. And then they come to my committee, or at least the committee that I'm chairing this semester, only if there's some controversy about whether, you know, there's disagreement among the two readers. Uh, both uh, do not agree that it's passing, uh, one or both. And in that case, it gets reviewed by the committee and they have sort of the final word. Um, and jump in if there's questions as we go along. I, you know, those of you who have had me in a classroom know we can go on for some time, so <laughs> try to uh, keep it under control. Um, you know, the first element is your, your resume, uh, and our hope is that we're, you, know, you won't fail because you don't have a really strong resume. I mean, I can pretty much guarantee that. But we're really trying to make sure that you are ready to start your job search and you have a professional looking resume. Uh, so with that in mind, you know, uh, we do include it in the portfolio and we do give you uh, feedback about it. Uh, there are lots of great websites about resumes. Unfortunately, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but uh, along with many good res res uh, resume websites that will give you advice, there are also some templates that I think are sort of overly cutesy, uh, you know, where you can have, you know, a very busy kind of resume. I mean, generally, we're going to guide you towards a more conservative, professional approach to a resume. Ultimately, you can do whatever you want. One of the pet peeves that seems to be sort of a universal way to get, uh, you know, off on the wrong foot when we're reviewing your portfolio is if you don't really know what your degree is. Because, you know, we get all these, you know, resumes where we'll say like, you know, John Smith, M-L-I-S, period, or something, you know, or, I mean, so know what your degree actually is supposed to be, how it's supposed to be written when you put it on your resume. Uh, you know, again, it's usually the first thing we look at, and you want people on your side <laughs> From the very beginning and so you know when you have to write back and say well now look up what your degree actually is you know then you know that's kind of the kind of stuff that we would rather that you've already thought about but it's not a deal breaker by any means um, the personal statement try and look at the actual description of the items in the personal statement uh, you know because it's called a personal statement sometimes students will interpret that as meaning a stream of consciousness kind of approach to this essay, you know. Well, one day I woke up and I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. So I was talking to my friend Betty and we were having coffee and it was at Starbucks over and, you know, and you kind of go like, hold it, you know, slow down here. Like, let's actually get into, you know, yes, we're interested in what led you to the profession, what led you to, you know, decision to become a librarian and pursue your uh, master's degree with the School of Library Science. But we, you know, we also are kind of hoping that this isn't an overly chatty, sort of totally informal approach to this essay. Think about it still 
you know, professional writing. Uh, it is a personal narrative, so obviously you'll bring in life experience and other things uh, that led to that decision and to this life path. Um, what else about the personal statement? You know, it does ask for a few other things, you know, uh, like what area you think you might be specializing in, even if you didn't choose a specialty area in your course of studies. Uh, it asks you to think about the goals for continuing education, how you plan on you know, keeping up with changes in the profession, and it also asks you to think about or articulate something about your plans for the next couple of years after graduation. So, you know, when you get to that part, you know, we know it's hard when you're just graduating. You don't know necessarily how the next five years are going to go, maybe not even the next five days. But you can at least say, this is my life plan at this point. And telling us in that essay, well, my five-year plan is to first come up with a plan. Well, I mean, we want to hear a little more than that. So, I mean, you know, it just, again, it's a chance to think about where you think you're headed, you know, what you want to do once you finish uh, the program. And are any questions uh, about that part of uh, the portfolio? Um, yeah. This might just be a personal preference on our end, but does it matter what format we use for the resume and artifacts in terms of a PDF or a Word document? Yeah, matter? I think it does matter sometimes as far as, uh, I mean, you know, uh, for the actual essays, Mm -hmm. You know, Word docs or PDFs are fine. Um, where it gets a little problematic is about some of the artifacts. Right. You know, somebody might have done, you know, like they're trying to submit an artifact that's like a spreadsheet that was done on an Apple version of Office or something. I mean, you know, people don't want to figure out how to, how to open all these different files. So, you know, you can save things as PDF, you can scan hard copies to PDF, you know, you have some options. John? Yeah, just going off that same question, I wanted to clarify. Um, there are some artifacts that I think are lodged in Blackboard, like perhaps from 600, the uh, the exam, or or something that that was a test that was taken on Blackboard or something like that, where I, and I have a Word document version of it. Um, would there be a way to link to those Blackboard artifacts? Uh, you can't or? link to anything that's in Blackboard. OK, so you have to find a way to download that somehow and create a file with it. And generally, that's the kind of thing you should be thinking about when you're in that course. Right. You know, you should be talking like if something is you know, listed as an artifact and you're, it, you're in a core course and it's being offered or delivered through Blackboard, you should be talking to the person that's teaching that course about how can I retrieve some form of this artifact so I can later submit it. Good, okay, thank you. Okay. Um, was there anything else that, yeah? <laughs> Another question along sure. those lines. Uh, for example, this in 601 for my Pathfinder, I created a web page. So it, in, in that scenario, I can just link to the. If you have uh, what I recommend, and this, mm -hmm. you know, again, because you, this will come up with the technology course artifacts as well. Right. If something is like a web page, I would do two things. I would, you know, you can uh, deliver it in a PDF form. In other words, where you, you know you can actually, you know, save it as PDF, or if you have to print it and scan it to a PDF, so that you have a nice PDF version of it that's independent of, you know, it working on some other web server or S web or wherever else it might live. But then also incorporate the URL into that document, so that you know if I want to go to actually see it live on the web and test links and things like, or whatever, I can do that if it's available. But if I only really am interested in reading the content that's being presented in this web page, I don't have to leave the Blackboard environment. I can just view it as a PDF. Okay, thank you. So I would recommend both. Now, um, let's see, with uh, the summary of artifacts is really just that. I mean, you, we don't need a lot of narrative there, but we do want to just see one list, you know, with some annotation about these are the artifacts I'm presenting, this is what you should be seeing, this is the course they came from. The uh, artifacts themselves, I mean, a lot of times people want to know, like, should I go back and correct those things that were marked wrong on this artifact, or if there were, you know, we want to see the artifact as much as possible as it was delivered to you with whatever instructor comments there were, if they exist. 
Yeah. Okay, so we should, like, there's some artifacts that I have that actually have the instructor comments on them to where, like, I saved the copies that they commented on. So should I include those or should I just include the ones that I submitted? Like, it wouldn't be correct if it just has, like, the comments on the side. You know, generally what we're, if there's a copy of an artifact that's been graded and returned with comments, that's the one we'd like okay. you to submit. Okay. Um, the learning outcomes essay, as people have mentioned, is really you know the heart and soul of the portfolio. I mean, that's really the place where you know you will explain to us in a convincing way why and how these artifacts that you're presenting demonstrate that you've mastered the various learning outcomes that we or achieve but learning outcomes that we expect uh, out of the core curriculum. Uh, so really, uh, there's a couple of things about the Learning Outcomes essay that I'd like to just emphasize or, or highlight. Um, you have some latitude about how you choose to organize it, but choose a way to organize it. I mean, again, the stream of consciousness approach to like, well, oh, and by the way, here's another artifact, and I guess it means that it's connected to this or, you know, Think about an organized essay. Now, some people might choose to organize them by core course and then around each artifact and then tie those back to the learning outcomes. You know. Or sometimes people decide to organize it more around an individual learning outcome and say, well, this learning outcome was supported by these two core courses and the evidence from these two core courses are these artifacts. So I mean, you can kind of do it either way. Um, but kind of think about how you want to have an organized learning outcomes essay. Because really this is the, the most central piece of your portfolio for us. And don't kind of conflate uh, you know, a rationale, like there was earlier language in the uh, guidelines about, well, we just wanted you to write a rationale about why this was an appropriate artifact. We're really kind of moving away from that idea. We've identified the artifacts, and now we want you to explain how they demonstrate that you've achieved these learning outcomes. So the rationale is already kind of there for why they should be included. Uh, so for example, I mean, sometimes you know, people will go into a lot of detail about, well, here's my thesaurus project from 602. And I did this big thesaurus on, I don't know, gardening or whatever it was, and I, I did, 20 million terms, and I had, you know, but they never really explain how doing a thesaurus sort of informs them about how information systems work, about controlled vocabularies, about information retrieval issues, uh, you know. So again, the important part is not just to say, <clears throat> I've, you know, in your learning outcomes essay, you know, you reference the artifacts. But to just do a lot of description of the artifact and not really explain how it ties to the learning outcomes that are important about information organization or information retrieval uh, will be sort of viewed as a problem. You know, so you need to kind of connect that artifact and what it had you do to what you know, we expect or hope that you've used it to learn about in terms of the core competencies that are identified. Yeah? I have a question from someone online before I lose it. OK. Um, if the student's instructor suggested corrections, do you want the suggestions and her corrections in the portfolio? I assume you mean like a, a paper where somebody handed it back to you and said, could you do more work on this or change this or whatever? I, I don't think we need every iteration of an artifact. But I mean, sort of the final version and whatever final grade it had would be the one that you would select. Um, something else I wanted to touch on uh, about the Learning Outcomes essay is that there are parts of that that could be supported by things that are not necessarily part of your list of artifacts. For instance, if you did a professional field experience and really you know, thought, wow, this really advanced my understanding of a particular facet of librarianship, or if you had an assistantship you know, while you were here, um, 
and you want to tie some of that experience, some of that experiential learning into uh, how it supports some of the learning outcomes during these core competencies, that would be appropriate as well. So, you know, again, the artifacts are not the only evidence that you can present. You can present other forms uh, of evidence of your learning, uh, if you wish. Yeah? Um, suppose that we did a GA ship or an assistant ship of some kind, and we wrote or did, did a project for that assistant ship, so it was only a class. Can we include that in the, in the portfolio? Sure. You know, really, the portfolio uh, description of what you include is sort of the minimum. And I know, you know, we do say about being selective and, you know, you don't have to include everything you ever did, but anything that you think is an important component of what you got out of the program, certainly appropriate to include. And then just, you know, of course, discuss in the Learning Outcomes essay how this particular project that you did, even though it wasn't tied to a course, connects back to the core competencies and the associated learning outcomes or even what kind of core course area that project that what part of our core curriculum helped you accomplish the things that you did in that assistantship project um, I think that was all I really had in the way of things that I wanted to oh well uh, there is one last thing that's already been said or talked about that I really would like to reiterate, and that's about quality of writing in general. I mean, I've talked about it with the, you know, sometimes the nature of a personal statement becoming a little too breezy or, you know, stylistically and chatty. Um, but we expect, you know, that you can present this final or near final draft to us in a really well written uh, form, standard English, you know. And if, uh, if it's really problematic, you know, you'll get something probably back almost immediately from your advisor that says, you know, you need to perhaps chat with someone in the writing center or have someone else look, revise or look at this with you. Uh, if it's, you know, again, there, there can be several ways that can happen. I mean, I mean, where something can be deemed unacceptable in terms of the writing. Uh, occasionally, it's just where somebody is kind of dashing off a quick draft, and I think, well, I want to get this to my advisor. Uh, the, the draft I see or want to see within that, you know, period, any time up to two weeks before the due date, any draft you send me, I expect to be really well proof proofread, you know, where you've paid attention and given it sort of your best effort. So a draft doesn't mean I dashed off something and kind of didn't really even run spell check or something. It means it's your first polished attempt, but because it's not the final version, we call it a draft. So, you know, the one way that I think you can really get maybe more than one way, I don't know, but one of the ways you can get in trouble with a portfolio submission is if it's just so poorly written uh, that it's really hard to make sense out of it. And so, you know, again, just, uh, and you're all graduate students and, you know, I know you all take pride in your writing, but uh, you know, be sure that you've given it that extra proofreading uh, and especially when you're ready uh, to have it submitted to your advisor for their, uh, what hopefully will be minor comments before you do your final submission. Um, on, on that note, I think Ashley's going to say a few quick words about the Writing Center. Before sure, we'll add straight full okay. Q&A. <laughs> so the Writing Center is happy to help all of you with these projects and all the rationales, any of the essays, anything that's written that you need help with, we are here for you and we are an invaluable resource for you. I will warn you that it does take quite a bit of time to get through a 10 to 12 page essay with the Writing Center Consultant because we're gonna go with you and we're gonna make a lot of comments and really guide you through that process. So the sooner you can start to meet with us, the more we can help you. 
and you can have an appointment with us every day since we are graduate students you will only see graduate student writing center consultants for our, our distance learning students we do have online appointments um, so you're more than welcome to make an online appointment they are synchronous I am the only person in the writing center that does asynchronous appointments so that is a possibility but you need to get my appointment slots early because they do fill up very fast um, since I'm the only person that offers that service but if you're available for a synchronous consultation, you will upload what you've got into a sort of chat window and we'll actually chat with you as we go through it. If you're here on campus or anywhere near UK, you can actually come in and see us in person. So options for everybody, no one should feel left out. Um, and if there's any questions about that, I'd be happy to answer them, but we would really love to work with all of you. I don't see a lot of my peers in the Writing Center and I wish I saw a little bit more. Um, you know, come visit, come say hello, come have some help. We're just here to serve you. You mentioned that it takes a while to go through a 10-page paper. It does. Um, how far, how, what's the lead time on making an appointment? Can they make an appointment for tomorrow or are you working a week out at a time? Uh, you, can, you can make an appointment for tomorrow today. You can call in and make an appointment for today, today, if you really wanted to. Um, you can make an appointment whenever. If you want to go ahead and schedule them, you know, a week out, a month out, that's fine too. You're more than welcome to schedule as early or as late as you'd like. I always just suggest that you do it early because there are only so many graduate consultants and those time slots do fill up very quickly. So make your appointments early and make as many as you think you need because you can always call us and cancel them or cancel them yourself. So no harm, no foul. We'd rather you have the appointment and not have to use it than need an appointment and there not be a slot. Jenny. So would a, would a 10 to 12 page paper be assessed in one, one appointment or multiple appointments? Very unlikely that we would get through one 10 to 12 page paper in right. 45 minutes, um, even with superb writing, because that is a lot of paper. Even reading out loud, you cannot read that fast. So 10 to 12 pages, I would suggest you make at least three, just to give yourself some breathing room, give the consultants some breathing room to really sit there and look at it with a critical eye because the quicker we have to go, the more things we can't address with you. So the more time we have, the better help we can provide. Thank you. Have you mentioned how a student will make an appointment? Is you can go online, um, uky.mywconline.com. So uky.mywc, my writing center, online.com. It's really easy to get yourself registered. You can see the screen, you can make your own appointments. If you're having problems, you can find us on the Division of Writing, Rhetoric, and Digital Media's webpage through UK and go ahead and just give us a call. Um, we're happy to help you over the phone, um, but you do need to register yourself first before we can actually see you in our system and help you make those appointments. And registration takes less than five minutes. So go home, do it tonight, be done with it, and don't worry about it after that. And the appointments are 45 minutes long, so you have 45 minutes of dedicated time one-on-one -on -one with a consultant who is all yours for those 45 minutes. Jenny. Will you repeat that web address again, please? Yes, I will. <laughs> UKY.mywconline.com. Thank you. Um, is the Writing Center available during the summer online? Or? We don't know yet. Um, our funding is not set for the summer, so I cannot say yes or no for that. I will tell you we do close during spring break. And since the portfolios this semester are due March 21st, that is the week before spring break. I personally won't even be here, I will be in DC. Um, so plan ahead and know that we will not be open that week. After spring break? Right. Spring break is the 16th. Yes. Can you help with resumes or just papers? Anything. If it has anything to do with writing, it is fair game for us. I will tell you that the Career Center, the Stuckert Career Center, is a wonderful resource for resumes. Um, I always suggest that people go see them and then come see us and then maybe go see them again because it's always nice to have multiple sets of eyes look at something. Um, I'm really good at helping you make sure that you have a lot of parallel structuring and that it looks good in terms of the content. The Career Center can help you figure out what you want to put on there, what kinds of things to highlight, where you should stick your internship if you have one, you know, what things make you unique and stand out on a resume. 
You know, about resumes too, I think one of the key parts of it is that it should be pretty concise. You know, and uh, you know, a cover letter is a place where you can really expand on you know how your unique skills map to a job you're applying for. Uh, sometimes I've seen resumes where someone will list a retail experience and then go into like a long two paragraph description of like, well, every day, you know, we'd first we'd set up all the stock and then we, you know, you really just have to kind of explain in a resume, you know, where you worked, what the dates were, what the title of the job was, and, and the, a simple statement of what the duties were. And then, you know, more narrative can go in a cover letter about how you can use that experience in a job setting that you're applying for. Um, could you uh, give some examples about what you feel is uh, too cutesy of a resume in terms of Anything that has cats on it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, actually I like cats. I, uh, uh, you know, what, what I have seen sometimes are, are templates that um, you know, maybe use a multi-column format, and over on one side there were, you know, Venn diagram things with like work-life balance, you know, like, and then in that it you know, would say things like, well, my social life, I like, you know, dancing and, and partying or something, and then, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the key parts of it, you know, it's appropriate to include some of your unique skills, you know, I mean, often a resume will have, you know, a little section of unique skills. Uh, but I mean, one of the, I've seen examples where, you know, there'll be like, uh, like a little scale bubble rating of like your, you know, so it'll have things like people skills and you'll self-assign your, you know, yourself a three or something. You know? <laughs> I, I think it's a little too much information, you know, sort of, I mean, you can say I have good communication skills or you know in my retail experience shows I have good people skills but most of that would be described in a cover letter so I mean I guess I would just recommend go to like our career center or there's a whole bunch online of career center uh, websites about resumes uh, from a number of different uh, institutions Now doing just like three for all questions. Um, <laughs> since the portfolio is due um, March 21st, um, the classes we're taking this semester, um, if we're in our last semester, um, we're not going to be all the way done with those, obviously. But if we really feel like those classes did us uh, a lot of good, um, is there something? we can, like, a, in lieu of an artifact, like, something we can put in there that goes over what we feel that class is doing for us at the moment, even if it's not quite finished yet. I would recommend putting something to that effect in one of your essays. For example, like your, what you got out of the classes essay. Right. I think, yeah, you could include uh, some, I mean, the hope is, of course, and, and we pretty much, I think, ensured that this is the case, that no one is still missing a core course by the time they're ready to do the portfolio. So, you know, even though, you know, that, I mean, the program goes by quickly for people, you know, and so you do have, like, that semester, all of a sudden, you're doing your portfolio if you've been at it full time, and you might really be in the midst of three or four really important classes to you, at least in terms of your area of specialty. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think in terms of like, you know, in your personal statement where you address things like your area of specialization, you know, that's a place where you can add some narrative about other courses that you're taking that are, that, are, that uh, sort of show how, how that area you've identified is being supported by your curricular activities. You could include some things in your learning outcomes essay. Uh, but again, you know, if you don't have actual artifacts, you know, um, you know, you can certainly include just some, you know, summary narrative uh, about those courses. Thank you. You know, something else that I just wanted to uh, jump in about too while I was thinking of it is in that personal statement, <clears throat> there is, and I was re looking at reviewing it, the items listed with it, 
And there is uh, item three that says comments on how well the program met your needs. And this is really valuable for us. I mean, and you know, again, in terms of stylistic approaches to it, you know, we're not expecting, you know, people to like be glowing, you know, like, oh, well, the program was just so wonderful. I mean, that might be your opinion, that's great. Uh, but uh, it is a place where you can, in a professional kind of way, give us some feedback about, you know, how good was your advising? How well did the program, I mean, did you have enough course selections? Did, you know, did you have uh, uh, more online or less online than you wanted or whatever it might, might be? Um, because this is, you know, I mean, obviously the portfolio, we're using it to judge uh, that you've successfully uh, completed what we hope from the program. But it's also a way that we can assess the program for ourselves. And so it gives us some valuable input from you. So, you know, again, that uh, is an area that uh, we hope that you'll pay some attention to when you write your personal statement. I had a question for Alexa. Yes. I was wondering if you could briefly talk about your process of writing the learning outcomes essay and how you structured it. Did you look at the outcomes and, and write in that order or vice versa? Um, yeah, I basically just tried to go through, um, I tended to structure everything as I went through and put my portfolio together chronologically. So I did all my core cap classes and then I focused on my three. Um, artifacts I was including from my children's uh, late courses. Um, I really tried to focus mainly on the fact that I had taken so many classes as far as like children's and teen let go. Um, I was actually in my final semester I was enrolled in both a public libraries course and another children's lit course so there were a lot of artifacts that I wanted to include um, that I wasn't really able to since I didn't feel like they were quite there as far as the rest of mine had gone. Um, and I did talk at length about that in my learning outcomes essay. I talked about, um, I really tried to focus on how I had tried to structure my classes as I went through, because I had a pretty good idea when I began the program that I wanted to focus mostly on children's and teen-led stuff. So um, I think that, I mean, I, obviously I don't grade the portfolios, but I thought that that was kind of a good way to go about doing it, to kind of talk about why I took the things that I did and what I got out of them. All right, any other questions? I'll, I'll ask a question. <laughs> uh, are there, Ashley, mm -hmm. the top five list of most common writing problems? Not that we have on our web page. I would say it depends on... Well, from your perspective. From my perspective, lack of organization, lack of clarity in writing. Um, when I read a sentence and I can't understand what you mean, um, that there's that the message doesn't come across as clear. Um, Minor grammatical errors, things like commas and subject verb agreement that are pretty easy to catch um, when somebody walks you back through the rules that you've probably forgotten. Um, but really minor things that can, you know, really change the meaning of a sentence when they're not there, um, which goes into issues of clarity. After that, um, lack of effort. If you throw something down on a page, it's not gonna reflect, you know, your retrospective on what you've done. What I would like to see people do is plan a little more and take time to write and rewrite because your first draft is never a final product. I write a lot of drafts for everything that I turn in and I go back and I read the first one and I think, what was I thinking? And drafting is just as an important stage in writing as proofreading and editing because drafting lets you think through what you're saying. It lets you think through what you've learned and then you'll actually come up with things second or third draft and that never would have occurred to you that first draft. So don't just write one draft and then prove it to be a final. Give yourself more time than that to really delve into the writing and see what thoughts come across and let's see, one more. <laughs> homonyms. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely see a lot of issues with homonyms. Um, you know, spell check is not enough. 
What is a homonym? A homonym <laughs> is a word that sounds the same like patients and patients. I have a lot of patients, like you're talking about medical patients, or I have a lot of patients like the fruit of the spirit patients. Mm -hmm. Those are two different words. <laughs> And if you are not attentive in your writing and you do switch them, the person that's reading them, because they don't know, they haven't read it you know, the 50 times that you've read it, will read it the correct way and wonder what on earth you're talking about. <laughs> so making sure that you actually go back through, I always tell people, read everything that you write aloud. Because you will catch so many things when you read it aloud. We're verbal communicators 85% of the time, most of us, would you agree? And so it's really important that you hear what you've written on a page because you'll be able to tell, naturally, you have an ear for English, what is going wrong and what is going right. Cases like that, you won't necessarily catch homonyms, but you have to pay attention. If you're using words, language, that maybe is a little unfamiliar to you, trying to elevate your style, go back and check them against the dictionary and make sure that you have picked the word that you meant to pick and not the one that kind of sounds like it. It's an easy thing to do, it's an easy thing to miss if you're just not paying attention. So the more time you can take with your writing, the better it is. I, I agree with everything Ashley was saying. <laughs> and, uh, and in a longer essay, you know, like if your learning outcomes essay is you know, 10 to 12 pages, some attention to like paragraphs, like, uh, section headings, you know, like not just, uh, I don't want to see like five pages, it's one paragraph, like it just sort of goes on, you know, I mean, uh, you know, that's another way, I mean, not only helps you organize things, but it also helps the reader follow your train of thought. You know, like, okay, well now we're, we're talking about a new core area, or we're talking about a, a, a new learning outcome, or whatever it might be. Do not underestimate the power of transitions. They are a very important thing, whether it's a heading or whether it's the opening sentence of a paragraph. You have to transition those ideas right. so that people reading what you've written understand where your mind is going and, and you, how it relates. And, and part of that, you know, it's, it's okay to actually have a little introduction that says, <laughs> I'm, introductions and conclusions or, or summaries are kind of good things sometimes mm -hmm. because, you know, uh, if, you know, when an essay just sort of like, when it, you just jump in somewhere and then it just ends, you know, it, it is sort of nice for us as readers of this, you know, to, to follow the narrative, you know, and understand sort of, well, this is what you're, this is how you, this is your roadmap, how you're going to describe your learning outcomes, and then you know, here's, you know, the rationales and the different things that you've thought about, and at the end, you know, this is where you kind of can wrap up things and say, you know, so collectively, you know, whatever, these all together mean I've learned this. John. Uh, yeah, just one other question for Alexa. Um, out of curiosity, what kind of feedback did you get back after the pass fail, or the the, the pass in your case? None. <laughs> I didn't, yeah, I, I got the pass, and then that was it. I didn't go out seeking it either, though. So, <laughs> and maybe if I worked a little harder for it, I would have gotten some. But I I just got my pass, uh, no, and I was like, yay. <laughs> Yeah, and there is, and, and really, you know, we understand that this is something that people have worked really hard on, and it's kind of almost a little bit of a letdown. I mean, all of us sort of have, you know, the need for some pat on the back a little bit once in a while, you know, where you kind of, good job, or something, you know, and, and all you're really going to get is pass. Pass. That's literally <laughs> and it. You know, I don't know if the letter is actually where you open it, it's one word, it's, it's like, pass. It's like you know, but, maybe two small paragraphs. <laughs> it's really brief. <laughs> no, um, you know, again, like for us, uh, you know, we really agonized some about some of these issues when we migrated from the final written exam to the portfolio approach. And as I said, the portfolio has been evolving ever since we identified it as a possible exit requirement. Um, you know, we really did think some about, well, in the, pa in the past with the final written exam, you could pass with distinction. You, know, you kind of would get like, extra good pass, you know. Uh, and we really did talk about it for a while, like, well, you know, should we try and do that with the portfolio? But our conclusion was that our hope is that since you can be, you know, sort of pre-approved uh, in a sense by submitting it to your advisor and getting some feedback and such, we really think they're all going to be exceptional, you know, or that's our hope. And to actually sort of be able to 
take one essay and say, well, this one's a pass and this one's like a super good pass, it, it becomes really difficult to make those kinds of distinctions. And our goal here is to really just uh, assume that everyone is going to do a really fine job with this and that our you know, intent is that not only will you maybe walk away with something that's actually useful, that is where you've had a chance to reflect about your program and maybe piece some things together during this exercise, and it's also something that you can download from Blackboard and, and take with you uh, as you know, part of an interview or something like that, if there are parts of that package that you think could be useful. Uh, and then it also gives us, hopefully, some really meaningful ways to evaluate our program and what we're doing. You know, if you can't really explain to us, or and I mean by you, a bunch of people collectively can't explain how or why an artifact is really important to any of these learning outcomes, then maybe we need to look at the artifact itself and what we're doing in that course. So I mean, it feeds into our ongoing program assessment and a whole lot of things that's very useful for us in addition to what we hope will be useful for you. Uh, one request from the online folk. Uh, if Professor Miller, can you give like five top tips to summarize tonight? From your perspective. Go! I can go! <laughs> um, start thinking about your portfolio from day one. You know, really as you're taking all the core courses, uh, you know, look at the learning objectives. Uh, for that course as you know and not just when you first get the syllabus on that first day of class but throughout the semester and you know think about how the things you're doing in that course support those learning outcomes and how you might write about how those artifacts support it um, so start thinking about it as you're taking the courses save your artifacts <laughs> uh, because we don't want to hear two years later well by the way remember I think you uh, had you know this class with this professor can somebody help me find this you have to make sure that you're taking care of that part of the process uh, I guess number three uh, develop throughout your program good writing skills and if you need you know if you struggle at all if you've ever gotten feedback during your courses you know where you've had to resubmit a paper multiple times or uh, other faculty during that process have commented at all about you know, maybe you should chat with the writing center. Maybe you should chat with the writing center if that's the case. You know, so I mean, again, you know, think about you know being um, aware of how good a writer you are, and if you need help with that before you actually have to confront the portfolio being due in two weeks or something. Um, that's put in some time and effort. Put in time and effort. Yes. Uh, and yes, consult with your advisor. Thank you for the filling in the blanks. But, and 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 be aware of the timelines. You know, I mean, you know, again, the advisor is there to help you. But if it's you know ten minutes before that two week deadline, it it gets tougher for us to give the amount of attention that we might want to give. Yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge real quick that we're exactly at the, the one hour mark. I know some people um, online especially had uh, written saying they had limited time tonight. So if we could just check and see if anyone, uh, well, either here or online has, who has to leave soon has uh, a question to squeeze in before you wrap this up. Uh, if there's any last questions. No? If, if not. Then we're exactly right on time. That's unbelievable. Yeah, I'm done with that. Amazing. <laughs> okay, well, good luck, everyone. Yeah, thank you for all coming out tonight. I hope this was benefit.